We are now very excited to welcome two leading journalists in our community. Please welcome Iranian journalist and women's rights activist Masi Alinejad in conversation with Nazanin Ansari, who is managing editor of Kahan London. Thank you very much. Can you hear us? Yes. It's slow. Can you hear me? I don't need a microphone. <laughs> well, compared to her, I don't. The reason that I got expelled from Iranian parliament just because I have a loud voice. <laughs> yes, it's true. Oh, so, here. now I have my voice, okay. So, Masih Alinejad needs no introduction. I mean, as a journalist, human rights activist, you're one of the most recognized, you have one of the most recognized voices, names, and faces. And certainly, uh, you don't need any introduction. Uh, others have talked about you. Uh, Sheryl Sandberg, uh, for one, uh, she commended you for building a platform to bring the voices of uh, Iranian voices, Iranian women's voices to the international scene and to allow the international community to have a chance to see another side of life. And you've also been recently nominated uh, for the Nobel Peace Prize. You follow in the footsteps of, of course, Dr. Shirina Abadi, who won the Nobel Peace Prize, and also, let's not forget Mrs. Nargis Mohammadi, who only recently got herself, after a five-minute trial, another eight years in prison. And one of the charges, according uh, to the human rights organization, Iranian human rights organization, was being nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, of course, let's uh, not forget you've got uh, your own name on a uh, congressional resolution, Senate resolution, and it's called uh, Masih Alinejad Hunt Act of 2021. You were a victim of transnational kidnapping plot. And, but when you were accepting your Nobel uh, uh, nomination, you said that you have to stop uh, gender apartheid in Iran. And for a lot of young uh, Iranian Americans, for a lot of uh, even Iranian girls, they cannot understand what gender apartheid means. So can you explain to us what it means? First of all, such an introduction. Um, thank you so much. Salam be hamigi. Khairi khushalam chehrai Irani inja mibinam. I'm so happy being among all amazing people here. And... Um, I have to say that when they say what gender apartheid means, I don't want to go further and talk about what happened to women uh, after the revolution. Let's just talk about what happened to us five days ago. Five days ago, a 17-year-old girl was beheaded by her husband, which I cannot even call her husband, because the Sharia laws in Iran allowed her to get married uh, with, her co with her cousin at the age of 14. So for me, this is not just an honor killing happening by family. The honor killings being supported by Sharia laws in Iran. So this is called gender apartheid. The revolution after like 42 years, supposed to help people, but now as you mentioned, Shirin Abadi made an apology for being involved in revolution. I was only two years, old, two years old, and I want to say that the revolution itself became a revolution against women. I asked many people in Iran that, what was the reason? What was the reason? What was your feeling that you felt that instead of reforming, you, you asked for revolution? Many people say that because we needed more political freedom. What happened? We didn't gain any political freedom. We lost all the social freedom that we already had. We had so many, uh, you know, Beyonce's, we had so many singers in Iran, all left in Iran because women are banned from singing. Women are banned from choosing what they want to wear. Women are banned from traveling abroad or getting passport without getting permission from their husband. Women are banned from all their basic rights. So all the laws in Iran are against women. That is why I called it gender apartheid. Many people in the West, maybe, uh, when they see my campaign against compulsory job, no, I mean, they always keep saying that. First of all, why I don't see any uh, 
I don't see Rob Nadi here. <laughs> yeah, this conference is about Iran. Honestly, I was expecting to see Rob Nadi or people from Secretary Blinken's office who cares about Iran. This is about Iran. They are talking to our oppressors. We are the victim of gender apartheid. You go and negotiate with our oppressors, but you don't want to listen to us? I hope they listen to me right now. Many people in the West, they say that, um, you know, why you care about hijab? So much you care about hijab, we have so many bigger problems in the Middle East. I have to say that compulsory hijab is the main pillar of a gender apartheid regime. Compulsory hijab is a flag for Islamism, for Taliban and Islamic Republic. To me, compulsory hijab is like the Berlin Wall. And that is why I say that if we tear this wall down, then the gender apartheid won't exist. So that's the reason that I picked up compulsory hijab, because I strongly believe that this is the first step toward uh, human, human dignity. A lot of people say that so many bigger problems in the Middle East. I say that what is bigger than human dignity? Thank you. Yeah. I, I interviewed, I mean, we were in a conference together with Mrs. Fatima Sepehri. Oh, yes. She's a, a lady, veiled lady from uh, Khorasan, and her, she lost her husband in the Iran-Iraq war. And she's now one of the proponents of women's rights issues in Iran. Why? Even though she is veiled, because she lost the uh, guardianship of okay. her children, of her child, uh, when her husband died. And I remember that you yourself, in divorce, when you got divorced in Iran, you lost your, the guardianship of your child. Uh, you faced, as a, even a little uh, girls uh, in school, being forced to wear the hijab. If they don't, uh, they will be marked for a long time, like you were marked in Iran. Uh, as far as insurance laws, I, I am very lucky to have been born before the revolution but also very unlucky, because I saw what it was, what mm. heaven we had as far as women's rights were concerned. In 1974, 75, for your information, we had equal rights amendment, equal pay for equal work, when even the United States even to now doesn't have it. So these are the things that we lost. And if we say, if you say the revolution was anti-women, you are right, mm. because the first woman that was executed was Mrs. Farouk Ruparsa, who was the Minister of yeah. Education. And her crime, as they stated, was prostitution and embezzling of state funds. So now let's move beyond hijab. Uh, you, have, you, have create, you created a lot of campaigns, White Wednesday campaign, um, where's uh, my weapon is my cam... Uh, no, cam my camera is my, my weapon. My camera I don't is have my any weapon. weapon. <laughs> camera is my weapon. But also you moved beyond that to uh, organizing a lot of campaigns for sports people, for artists, for even uh, the Ukrainian, uh, shot down Ukrainian flight, for mothers who had lost their children in the Oban 2019. Tell us a little bit more about that. Um, I mean, to be honest, I have to say that I don't want to say that I created a campaign. The movement exists in Iran. What is missing here, they don't have any media. And um, I remember, I mean, I didn't have any, a lot of people think that I have, like, I, I have planned to launch the campaign against compulsory job. I'm going to be very honest with you. I just talked about my own story. I just share about my pain. I just talked about how I learned from my pain to be powerful. And that actually encouraged many women within the society to get united. So, because the Iranian regime survive when they see that the people are scared. The biggest reason that they survive is the fear. So I help women like me to overcome their fear because I was scared most of my life. With, I mean, because of political pressure, because of social pressure, family pressure. I had to start my own revolution from my family's kitchen. So what I did, I actually started to talk to women. Be your own uh, savior instead of uh, waiting for someone to come and save you. That actually, uh, I mean, I learned from my people, those who joined me, 
to give them a platform. And I remember that when the head of the Revolutionary Guard says that, uh, no, sorry, the head of the Revolutionary Court uh, appears on TV and said that if anyone sent videos to Masih Alinejad will be charged up to 10 years prison. I was shocked. And I felt the burden, guiltiness, that what I'm going to do. I, I just went on TV and I said that this is it. Because I don't want to get anyone into troubles. What happened? Many mothers who lost their beloved one in Iran protest, they hold the pictures of their beloved one. They went to the same street that their children got killed, got shot in the head, in the chest, saying that, Massey, we want you to be our voice. They have a power vo powerful voice within the society, but they want us to echo their voices. So and I created different campaigns, like for uh, when Naveed Afkari got executed. Naveed was an amazing wrestler, champion in Iran. He knew what he was doing. When he got executed, I was miserable. You know, I actually, I was in my garden when I heard the news, and I was, I was furious. I was crying. I was helpless. What came to my mind that uh, I have to get all the people who were like Naveed, part of the national team, to get united. I went to them, and I said, I mean, in, I was always saying to myself that um, in Iran, women are not allowed to go to the stadium and enjoy, you know, football or supporting their food, uh, national team. In 21st century, a woman set herself on fire just because she wanted to support her national team, her favorite team. I was saying to myself that the FIFA should ban Iran, should boycott Iran, but no one listened to me. So I asked the athletes to join me. So I created a campaign called United for Naveed. So all the brave and heroes of Iranian people who were part of the Iranian national team for years and years, now saying that this is 21st century. You have to think about it, that these governments should go in international court, not international federation. Let me tell you, give you an example. President Biden, he had to get back and look himself when he was really young. He was supporting the idea of banning, you know, during the apartheid. You remember that? He was supporting the ban because of the apartheid. So we are suffering from gender apartheid in Iran. What is different? When we talk about banning Islamic Republic from everywhere and recognizing the civil society, they call us, oh, you are supporting the war or either supporting the deal. This is wrong. I am carrying the scores of the wound in my shoulder. Two of my brothers were, were injured during the war. I am a victim of war. Now you labeling us and many activists here. I see Laudan Buruman and many highly respected activists, human rights activists. You yourself, you're being labeled that you're supporting war when you say ban Iranian football until women of Iran are allowed to go to a stadium. Stand up against gender apartheid and listen to the voice of the mothers who lost their beloved one in Iran. You're labeling us that, oh, you're supporting war? No. Those who are actually calling Ghassem Soleimani a hero, he was a warmonger. I know that I'm furious because I really wanted to see Rob Mali here. I wanted to see the new administration here. When we talk about human rights, women's rights, it should be bipartisan. I criticize President Trump. I criticize President Biden as well because this is the reason that they came to America. My dream was to have freedom of expression in America. And now I see that Ilhan Omar, all those policy makers in America, they're being misguided by some think tanks here who are the Iran lobbies, who are being the voice of Iranian government rather than being the voice of Iranian people. That makes me furious. And let's be furious. Because many people in Iran, they're looking at you now. And they want to see that in 21st century, all the European countries, they dare to go and talk to our oppressors. They allow the children of Ayatollahs to come here, but they refuse to give visa to the family of the victims in Iran. All the Ayatollahs who say death to America, even those who were involved in hostage taking, their relatives are here in America. They have green cards. Regular guests on CNN. Where is CNN here? Where is Barbara Slavin? Why we go everywhere, they challenge us. 
I am the voice of Iranian people. Many of us here, being away from our families, it makes me furious and frustrated when I see a 17-year-old girl was, was beheaded. It didn't make a headline. But Ilhan Omar's legislation about Islamophobia made a huge headline. As a woman who grew up under Sharia laws, yes, I am scared of Islamic ideology. Millions of women in Afghanistan, they deserve and they have the right to be scared of Taliban and Islamism. I challenge and dare Ilhan Omar and many of those left and liberals to come and sit here and listen to the voice of Iranian people. If you're really looking for a stability in the region, you cannot go and have a negotiation with one of the most unstable regime. You have to recognize the civil society and those who dare to say no to gender apartheid. I know you understand my pain. I do, I do. And you talked about Afghanistan and certainly you have a campaign let us talk, that has taken the issue beyond Iran to Afghanistan to the entire Middle East. Now, um, what kind of an advice from your experience, from your expertise, do you have for these young women? You kidding me? Huh? I don't have any advice for women of Afghanistan. They did a great job. No, you are expert at what you do. I have advice and, for policymakers in America. But these girls who want to have their yes. voices. No, let me, let me, let us talk. <laughs> let no, us talk. Yes, okay, Nazarene, Nazarene. go on. The brave women in Afghanistan, they don't need any advice from me, from none of us in the West. We have to give advice to those in Norway, to those in America who call themselves feminists, liberals, and dare to go and negotiate with Taliban. Negotiating with Taliban means you're legitimizing one of the most terrorist and barbaric states. We have to give advice to them. Recently, the Esma Shabegu. Key. <sighs> say, say that again, say that that. No, Federico Mogherini, yeah, she is the hero of obeying the Islamism, but uh, one of the envoy of Afghanistan, she went to have a negotiation with Taliban. She wore hijab, Robina Amiri, she yeah. obeyed chadori, as Afghan women said. Women in Afghanistan say no to compulsory hijab. She was not forced to wear hijab in Norway. She did. And then you want to defend the right of women of Afghanistan? So my advice is nothing just toward the, all the feminists. Believe me, if you don't stand with your sisters in the Middle East, you have to fight Taliban and the Islamic Republic, the terrorists, here in the West, in America. I know that Americans here, you have a famous saying that what happens in, in, in Vegas stays in Vegas. But believe me, what happens in the Middle East, in Iran, in Afghanistan, doesn't stay there. It's going to infect the rest of the world. They came after me to kidnap me here in, in America. You think it was about me? Believe me, I'm not scared of my life. But the most scary thing is my, in my life is that Islamic regime tried to challenge the U.S. authorities on U.S. soil. And Biden, President Biden, still kept silent. If it was his son, if it was his relative, he wouldn't have been silent. He would have just gone after the Islamic Republic and said, just talk about the deal. And I want to tell you something, Nazanin. I, I want to tell you that I was for the deal. I was supporting the deal. I was supporting the reformists. I was working for reformist newspapers in Iran. We are not a bunch of oppositions here, like for 42 years, we, all of us. No, many of us, we had even hope on reformists. I had hope on reformists. I voted for the reformists. And I feel ashamed now. Many people inside Iran, they voted for reformist people as well. But now hear them. The opposition shifted. They changed. People have a new message. Believe me, you have to sit and listen to the voice of the mothers inside Iran. A mother whose son, Pejman Olipur, only 18 years, received five bullets in his chest. She is the true voice of Iranian opposition, saying no to Islamic Republic. Puya Bakhtiari's mother, Nahid, she was there while her son got killed in front of her eyes. She says no to Islamic Republic, and she received attacks 
She, her house was vandalized by the Islamic Republic recently. So what I say here, instead of listening to the, to, to the lobbyists, listen to the voice of Iranian people within the society. Whether you help us or support us or not, we're going to get rid of the Islamic Republic one day. But the history will judge you. Well, we don't have much time left, but uh, recently I, I saw a very interesting statistics that in the past few years, the intelligence organs in, of Iran, they have multiplied five by five, they've uh, fivefold. Uh, right now we've got between 17 to 20 different security organs controlling the people. But having said that, uh, there was the panel today that Laudan Burumand was mentioning about the number, increasing number of protests. And um, there was uh, also a secret document that was, uh, uh, that was brought out by the hacktivist group, Edolat Ali, that actually uh, one of the officers there uh, was saying that uh, Iran, uh, the society is in a state of explosion and that only in the past year it has uh, seen an increase uh, of protests by 50% and the number of protesters uh, have nearly doubled in each of them. Certainly Iranian teachers, pensioners, um, investors, workers. Uh, workers, you name it, even prison guards, uh, they've been um, protesting rallies across Iran in more than 100 cities. If you go to kehanlife.com or kehan.london, we have all the videos with all their slogans. And so if we see a repeat, let's, let's just say, if we see a repeat of 2019, uh, I remember I go back to 2009. At that time, you were waiting to interview President Obama. He lost and, the chance. And, well, he lost the chance. <laughs> and so, yes, definitely. And uh, so did a lot of Iranian people lose the chance. You know, like Neda Agha Sultan lost her life. And then we come to 2019. We have the Oban protests. The internet uh, gets shut down again. Uh, 2020, uh, Secretary Blinken, even before he was elected, if they, he retweeted a tweet that if there's a repeat of 2019, what should be done? And it was silence. Now, now given your position now, your network with tech companies, with US officials, Congress, MEPs, European Parliament, if there is a, re a repeat of 2019, that we are, everybody is like, you know, expecting at some point, what will be your advice? What tools would the Iranians need? Sure. First of all, I want to actually tell the story about um, people of Iran and Obama. I know I don't have much time, but I'm going to be quick. Yeah. I remember that um, I had a meeting with Jake Sullivan and uh, Secretary Blinken and Secretary Pompeo as well. Um, and I said that in front of them, that Iranian people in the streets were chanting, Obama, you're either with us or with them. Because Obama in Persian means that he is with us. U means he. Ba means with. Ma means us. So people of Iran had a hope that he's going to be with us. But at the same time, when people in the street were calling him, Obama was sending secret letter to Ayatollah Khamenei. I actually met with uh, the officials in America, and I asked them, that, how do you feel now? Hillary Clinton said, regret. And um, I asked Jake Sullivan that whether Jake, he, he's going to support Iranian people. He said that we have to stick with our policy to get a deal. And um, what I want to say here that you see that Iranian people didn't get any help from anywhere, anyone, but it's still they're saying, uh, we don't want the Islamic Republic. So you are going to lose the chance to support Iranian people. My advice is so clear that the Iranian people are going to move on. When the Iran protests happened in the street, the internet was shut down for, I think, more than 10 days. Yep. They killed 1,500 people. Guess who was present on social media? All the ayatollahs, all the officials, and all their lobbyists trying to mislead the rest of the world, calling the people of Iran in the street hooligans. And at that time, I called all the tech companies. 
that you have to kick Khamenei out from Twitter. You have to kick all the officials out from social media. They said that in the name of freedom of speech, we're not going to do that. So what I want to advise, I mean, all the human rights activists, that when people of Iran are united, outside Iran, we have to be really tough to the tech companies and get united. Not only us Iranians. Look, Russia, China, Venezuela, Turkey, Taliban, Islamic Republic, all the dictators are united. They are united than us, the freedom fighters. We, the human rights activists from different countries, should get united as well and ask all the tech companies to kick out Putin, the Ayatollahs, Taliban, and all the dictators from social media until the day that Iranian people are allowed to use the same social media. Is that too much to ask? It's not. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very We're much. We're on time. We're on time. We're on time, and thank you very much for your attention and staying here and listening to us. Thank you, Massey. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nazanin, and thank you, Massey. Um, we'll be back in a few moments with our last panel of the day, so hang tight.